co-creator, cre the creator of the upcoming Crystal Lake Friday 13 series. Ladies and gentlemen, big round of applause, Brian Fuller. And two of our unfortunate victims from the movie, let's bring back Larry Zerner, who played Shelly, and welcome Tracy Savage, who played Debbie. Brian, you were here the other night for RRR. Is this, is this the best? But this was better, right? Well, yeah, yeah, okay. Sorry, RRR. Although Jason throwing a leopard at another person would have been pretty cool. Uh, Brian, I want to start with you. Now, I know the series is unique with a lot of fans in that a lot of them didn't kind of experience them in order. I was curious, what was your intro to the series? Was it this film? Was it a different one? Uh, my intro was the first one, uh, and I read it before I saw it. So I read it in Famous Monsters, which did synopses. So I was obsessed with Mrs. Voorhees from the age of 10, which was probably three years before I saw the movie. So it was all about Famous Monsters. Uncle Corey. Um, uh, uh, for Tracy and Larry, um, I'm just curious, how did you guys get involved in the film? Were you familiar with the first two at all, or is it just completely new to you? Um, I've been a child actress since I was two years old and had done lots of television, Little House on the Prairie, lots of wholesome stuff. <laughs> Little House on the Prairie, and going way back to Marcus Welby and Adam Twelve, and um, and so I worked a lot as a child actress, and I was getting ready, actually, to move away to Michigan to go to college in Ann Arbor. And uh, my mom was an agent at the time. She said, they're making this movie, and they're casting, and you should probably go out on the interview. Um, but I'm like, oh, Mom, I'm kind of done with acting. I'm moving away. Uh, but I went on the interview. It was titled Crystal Japan because... They were sort of hiding the title for a while, the real name, um, and I got cast and I got hired and I thought, well, this will pay for a semester or two at uh, University of Michigan. So I ended up um, working on the film. I still wasn't really sure what it was in the beginning. Uh, I wasn't a huge fan of the horror genre, but now I am. <laughs> um, so that's anyway, that's how I got, that's how I got started. Uh, yeah, my casting story is kind of interesting. I think a lot of people know it, but um, I was 18. I was, you know, want to be actor here in LA. Lived, you know, grew up in LA and uh, studying theater at CSUN and had a job handing out uh, movie tickets, you know, to, to to previews like you all, you know, you see, you want to go to the movie. And I was in Westwood on a Saturday night handing out tickets to a Australian movie called The Rogue Warrior that no one had heard of and no one wanted to see. And um, these people came up to me. And then, so, you know, it's like, like I look like that, right? I got the fro and I'm fat and then, you know, so that's it. And these people came up to me and go, are, are you an actor? And I'm like, you know, well, they must have seen me in Greece at Fairfax High because I rocked it. So, I it. Um, so I'm like, yeah, I'm an actor and they're like, well, we wrote this movie, and we think you'd be really good in it. And that was uh, Marty Catrosser and Carol Watson, and they had written it, and they just saw me, and were like, yeah, that's the guy. You know, it's like, fro, act, want to be actor, Shelly, that's him. Yes, yes. So, and, and I gave my agents, I had an agent, and they gave me my name, and a couple days later, I got a call to go down and audition. So I still have an audition, but uh, it was really like, Man, you're just like meant to be in this movie, and yeah, uh, yeah so yeah. it happened. Yeah. So the next time somebody's handing you out passes, just like take note of them because they might end up being in you know one of the conjurings or some shit later. Um, <laughs> Uh, Tracy, I want to skip right up to your death scene because, like as we talked about the, the trivia, it's, it's a it was a famous you know recreation of of Kevin Bacon's death. Uh, but he got to lay in a bed. You were in a hammock. What was that? What was that process like? I couldn't imagine that was very comfortable. It was um, it was really crazy. It was a, a crazy day of shooting. It took all day to shoot that like what two second shot, um, and it took uh, months of prep before. Basically, I'm giving away the film secret, but basically what they did is they um, created a replica of my torso from my hips up to my neck and made a foam rubber copy of my entire upper body. 
and then they glued it to my neck so that this upper torso is attached here and sticking out there. They cut a hole in the hammock and I got down underneath, kind of my body was under the hammock and the fake part of the body was out on top of the hammock except for my arms and my shoulders. And that gave a little play between where my real neck was and the neck of the little replica. And so they could push the knife up through there. But of course the whole deal was trying to make sure that the knife worked, that the um, seam, you couldn't see the seam from the fake neck to the real neck, and that the 3D, you know, is the knife coming out, um, you want to make sure that was right. So it was literally a day long on set trying to shoot that. I was in the makeup chair for probably six hours as they were putting the, and they really had one chance to get it. Um, I think they'd made two of those foam replicas of my chest, but they really wanted to do it in, in one take. And by the way, that foam... Well, took the other one home. Yeah. I, I, I sent it, actually, to my then fiancé, who's living in Michigan. <laughs> As a present, I put lace around. I really did, I swear to God. I, I, it was, well, hey, I was in California, he was in Michigan, so I sent him my chest. <laughs> Long distance relationship tips from the masters. Um, and then, and Larry, you didn't get a death at all. I mean, you got the appliance on your neck, but w w did you ever have a death scene? Was it ever scripted or anything? Or was it always meant to be an off screen? Yeah, unfortunately, it's always, it's always, it was always an off screen. People always ask me, like, did, did they ever film that scene in the bar? And they did not. They, that was it. I, I come in and, because it's like, is he faking it or not? I mean, I, I don't know. At this point, you think you know he's not faking it, but that's the, that was the thought behind it. Um, Brian, I want to get your opinion on this. Now, this, this movie introduces one of, I think, cinema's greatest monsters, which is Rick. Uh, he's such a fucking asshole. <laughs> I, I was sad, because I ran out to get, to get another drink, and I was like, I ran back, and I got here just in time to see him die. I'm like, oh, thank God, because like, you really just want to see this dude get it. Like, what is, she's like, Rick, stay with me. Why should I? Like, he's, I was just curious, can we get your thoughts on, on Rick and some of the other, maybe, uh, you know, the less wholesome characters of the series. I actually find a lot of the characters to be more wholesome than what their reputations are, and Rick's just kind of douchey and like making a comment about the weight and, and all of that. Uh, so it was fun to see him die more than uh, Chuck and Chili, who were my uh, point of view characters for the film. <laughs> Speaking of Chuck and Chili, did either of you ever question or uh, internalize or anything why all these like college age kids are hanging out with four year old potheads? <laughs> no. no. <laughs> Leave that to the nerds. Um, uh, I did want to ask the two of you about uh, Richard uh, Brooker, who passed away uh, a few years ago. Um, obviously, you didn't probably get to work with him too much, but maybe just memories from set or anything. By all accounts, he was like a really great, kind of funny guy. He, you know, in, in, the, in this genre, he's a legend. And um, everybody knows and knew of him and was sad when he passed away. For me, on the set, um, I didn't engage with him much. First of all, we were all in our teens, and he was probably 30. Um, he was a professional. He was a, a professional acrobat and um, kind of stayed in character the whole time. And he kept, at least as far as I was concerned, he kind of kept his distance from us. And he didn't hang out with us dumb kids. He was just kind of doing his own thing. So I didn't um, really ever get to engage much with him. But I know that the fans just love him. And uh, it's too bad that he's not here. Yeah, ne neither of us have any actual scenes with Richard during the film. We'd see him, he'd be, he'd be with his makeup on and smoking a pipe. He smoked a pipe, it was kind of weird to see him smoking a pipe. Um, and then I didn't see him again until uh, there was a screening at the New Art in t t 2002. Anybody, was anybody there? And, and, and me and Richard and Paul Kratka and Steve Suskind came. That was the first time I had 
see him and actually talk to him because we never talked on the thing. And then, you know, we'd go to conventions and then we sort of became friendly at conventions. And I, he was here at the, the 25th anniversary. We were right, I think, in this theater, um, right? Yep. Someone? Right? Yeah, yeah. Okay. We were here in the Chinese for, the, for 2007 and he was there. And, um, you know, he was a great guy. He actually won an Emmy for uh, um, uh, uh, something he invented, uh, some kind of uh, film process. He's a very talented guy. Uh, Tracy, a question for you. Uh, one kind of bummer note in this movie is that your character's pregnant, so Jason actually kind of gets another victim in the way there. Uh, D uh, Dana Kimmel, but uh, Chris, has talked about how she had some concerns about some of her character's uh, things in the script that she wasn't comfortable with. Did you remember ever having any conversations about the pregnancy thing, or was it just like, eh, that's fine? I was pregnant? <laughs> um, no. Not at all. <laughs> Just give me the script. I'm here to have fun. I'm moving away to Michigan when this movie's over, and I'm moving on with my life. And this is just a great way to spend six weeks with you know a big group of young people. I mean, the director and producers were in their 20s. They were kids, and um, so no, I really didn't um, question the script much. I just showed up. The shower scene and the sex scene were a little tricky. I was really just, you know, I'd just become an adult. I didn't have my mom on set with me, which I had done since I was two years old. And I knew I wanted to go on and be a, become a journalist, a broadcaster, which I did for 30 years. And I didn't, thank you. And I didn't, um, I didn't really want my face being shown while I'm having an orgasm so that the whole world would see, and that would be me for the rest of my life. And if I went on to be a broadcaster somewhere, that clip would come up. So I just like, so could you, could you figure something out? But I was a kid and I'm trying to negotiate this without my mom and without my agent there. And um, so as you saw, we, we, they had a shot of our feet. <laughs> and I was actually able to talk them into doing that and just, you know, just showing our feet as opposed to our face. And um, so that was tricky. I mean, as, as a young kid, I'm trying to like, I really don't want my face shown while you're doing this. And is there something we can do that's different? And um, and then the shower scene. Um, my teenage son has still not seen this movie. <laughs> he's going to come tonight. Her son who never seen the movie. Yeah, and but I'm he, like, let's just get a therapist right. He here. conveniently <laughs> had to work, so it's all good. <laughs> um. And uh, Larry, I wanted to know one thing about this movie. When I watch it now, after a few years, is Whenever somebody like walks in the barn, I'm thinking about the video game. We got some people who play the game. Who else wishes the barn had a goddamn door in the game, right? They close the darn door every time they walk in. Piss me off. Anyway, uh, can you you recreated Shelly for the game, and I use you quite a bit, and I've won once with you. Usually you're the first to die, but that's fine because I get to watch like a little mini Friday the 13th movie after. Uh, I was just wondering if you could talk about that process a bit because it's really the only new Friday stuff we've gotten in. A while. Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm a big gamer, and when they announced the game, I, I had a mutual friend who knew the guys at Gun who, who created the game, and we I, they introduced me very. But they had it. They had a not even a beta. They had an alpha demo, and they they were too poor to go into E3. They were here for E3. They just had a condo off E3, and like I went there and saw it, and I was like, I was like. This is not going to work. <laughs> I thought, I'm never gonna, this is not going to work. But then, then the game came out. It was great, and I and I met the guys and, and sort of befriended them. We were at Comic Con, and then they were like, "Well, let's put Jelly in the game." And I'm like, "Great, uh, great. How much do you want?" And they're like, "No, no, we're going to pay you." I'm like, "Oh God, this is like the best. They're going to put me in a video game, and they're going to pay me." And, um, so I didn't. Do, they had it's the animation's all the same for all the. They had one animation for all the. Campers, but I got to go in and do the vocal, which was, which was really challenging as an actor. I'm sure there's a lot of want to be aspiring actors or professional actors here. It's it's tough because you you're doing like every emotion in like like you know, then we're gonna die, you know, like do that, you know, for an hour. It's 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 a challenge, but it was a lot of fun. A lot of grunts. It's a lot of like oh oh yeah yeah <laughs> right. Uh, uh, Brian, I wanted to. Uh, 
this film moved away from the sort of camp counselor motif to do like the group of friends coming to the lake or the creek or whatever they have here. Uh, um, I was just curious, what were your thoughts on that? I know some fans were like, oh, it should be at the camp, but other, obviously, you know, three, four, seven, you know, had that motif instead. Well, it's, it's one of the first films, it's the first film that doesn't really name the killer. So that's something that, uh, fortunately, there's a lot of great kills. Uh, Vera's death still, my head snaps back every time I see it in 3D. And uh, you have the hockey mask. So it was, uh, it was a departure, and it wasn't necessarily doubling down on the mythology of Mrs. Voorhees and Jason Voorhees, because none of the characters named who the killer was. Nobody knew the mythology of Jason. And that was an interesting departure. And then when we get to four, it, everybody knows who they're talking about. And, and it kind of gets back into the groove. But maybe we needed that departure uh, just to make four land the way it did and, and the subsequent films. Um, I, I have questions about whether, uh, for instance, I had heard that there was a version of the script where Ali survived at the end. Was that not true? Okay. Uh, also, any of the footage of Chris's beheading, like, is that is that just, we've seen pictures. Okay. Can we look harder? When I did the documentary, they really looked, and, and they even, we, we, we were talking to the Carol File, the cinematographer, and it just seems to have been thrown away. I mean, but they did shoot an alternate ending uh, where, uh, they shot an alternate ending, so we're, uh, Chris is in the canoe, and you know she sees Jason up in the window. Instead of seeing Jason up in the window, she sees Rick up in the window. And she's like, oh my god, it's Rick. And she, she paddles over, gets out, and she, she's running on, she's on the, on the front of the cabin, and you see Rick through the window, and then they get to the door, and she opens the door, instead of Rick, it's Jason, and he slices her head off and just pulls it off, and they shot it. I saw him shoot it. And it looked great, and I don't know why they didn't use it. It was fantastic. It would have been. It's a better ending. It's, a, it's, it's just, it just landed so much, I thought. But no one knows where the footage is. There's pictures in the, in the Crystal Lake Memories book. I'm pretty sure it was Machete. Axe is kind of tough to do. Somebody should deep fake like she sees Rick, but then keep the same reaction where she's like, ah, no! Just like, oh, fucking Rick, he just sucks on it. Uh, just, um, a lot of the actors have talked about, uh, you know, making the film, the, you know, the 3D process, it was a new process, it was kind of a drag, um, and that when they would do another take, it was not because of a blown line or you know whatever it was because something with the 3d went wrong and i'm just curious for either of you watching it tonight is there anything do you remember like oh, i wish i could have done that specific part again if they allowed you to oh yeah that first we've shot it almost entirely consecutively as we the only thing we shot the the, the scene at the store with the motorcycle that was shot first and then everything else was shot in order uh, just from beginning to end. So that first scene of where Shelly comes out with the thing, I don't know. I'm the, yeah, I was, I, I'm not happy. I was like, oh man, I, I want to redo that. I wish I could redo that. It's not my best day. Yeah, I mean, people, they didn't, the director was wonderful, but he really was not concerned about our acting ability. <laughs> it was not even an issue, you know. What's my motivation? Well, just stand in the right place so the camera works. I mean, that was, that was really, the star of this movie was the 3D. And we never shot scenes twice because, you know, the delivery wasn't right or we fumbled the line. It didn't matter at all. And so, you know, it is what it is because that's, the 3D is still such a great effect and it's the star of the movie, so. We're not going to win any awards for acting in this movie. It's the best 3D movie shown in this theater tonight. There you go. And do you know at the time, it was the highest grossing 3D film ever at the time in 1982? Yeah, so, so, like, uh, so like the 2000s, it was yeah. the highest grossing 3D movie yeah. ever. In fact, they're showing Creature from the Black Lagoon in 3D 
here tonight at 11 o'clock. Do you want to? You must be thrilled because Larry has done an invaluable service for the fans over the years. As you know, that there's been a lawsuit going on that's kept us from having new Jason Adventures. And anytime there's a new development in that case, all the fans kind of look at this legal document that they post online, we're all like, yeah, I don't understand a goddamn word of this. And Larry, the saint that he is, who is a lawyer, uh, gets online and explains it all to us. I'm just curious, are you happy you don't have to do that anymore? Uh, no. Uh, well, I'm happy the lawsuit is over. Uh, you know, I, 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 left, well, I left acting and I became a copyright lawyer and an entertainment lawyer, and that's what I do. And, you know, this was like, oh, my jams are together, copyright law and Friday the Teeth, and I was like, this is the best. So I'm a little, I'm a little upset. I, I, I want there to be another lawsuit involved in <laughs> But uh, but I'm, I'm glad it's I'm glad it's over so we can get so we the can series. Play. I want to know. All about the Ryan, tell us everything you can tell us about the series. I, I can tell you a couple of things I asked for permission this morning. First of all, this is this is the first excursion of the writing staff. So we have uh, many of the writing staff here for Crystal Light. Uh, up in uh, rows one and two. Uh, we're officially so but this was our first kind of group outing and uh, the things that I've gotten permission to share about the show and if, if people want to ask questions I can say yes or no I can't answer them but the things I can share uh, that I'm very excited about is that we will have two scores we will have a modern score and a classic score composed by Harry Manfredini so you can watch both versions on the cock, as it were. Uh, I, I, well, we'll see, because it certainly uh, supports the time period in which we're telling the story. Um, and uh, Kevin Williamson is going to be writing a script for us, and that's very exciting. Uh, and the third tidbit, uh, Adrian King has a recurring role in, uh, in the first season. So, that's kind of a dream come true as I love that first movie. I love all of the movies, but that first movie is particularly close. Rank them right now. <laughs> and you, you, you didn't have Larry's phone number at that time when you were casting for the first season. But no, you just... I can't see what to do with your things away. Oh, well, that's a good one. <laughs> You didn't find my phone number. <laughs> you didn't know how to reach me either, I take it, right? You're getting any younger, buddy. I know the, the writing staff is out there going, I, I think we can make Larry a recurring character. Semi-regular. Semi okay, you guys, I, I, I got money. <laughs> uh, we have time for a few questions from the crowd. I saw your hand right there, sir. Yep. Where are you guys shooting the TV show? Uh, it's it's a it's a ways away, uh, likely Canada, honestly, because our money will go further, and we've got a very generous budget from the Peacock, but uh, we want to spend a lot of money on casting, so uh, we want to put it on screen in all sorts of ways. The, uh, we have one season that is ordered to production and another season that Peacock has to pay a very heavy penalty for. And when I pitched the show, I pitched four seasons. It's eight episodes and some change. Canada's where they shot Jason Takes Manhattan, so I mean, <laughs> as far as I'm concerned, it's, it's Crystal Lake. Yeah. <laughs> Crystal Creek, Crystal Creek. Uh, yeah. Hear of anybody else playing Jason in part three? I we just heard last year that there was another guy for maybe one scene on the farm. Yeah, I mean, I heard that, but we were we weren't there. And, we wouldn't have, we yeah. wouldn't have known. <laughs> but I never. Yeah. yeah. Um, there would have been no reason for that anyway. Yeah, I, I don't. Yeah. Good rumor. <laughs> the, the question was, is, would it someone else play Jason in the movie in a in a scene? Hey. Hey. Okay, but we weren't there, so. 
It's amazing. I mean, I, I didn't have much of an acting career, but that I have this, that, that this thing 40 years later, people come and they love this movie and I'm a part of this film history is, is amazing. I mean, I, I, you know, I knew a lot of actors much better than me, but you know, and, and they never got that, this part that became iconic. I sort of like, I, I grew up on the Universal Monsters, right? And it's like, you know, I'm like, I'm like, the equivalent of the guy who played Igor in Frankenstein, right? It's like you're you're right. You're like that's I, I got a I get a part of that. It's 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 amazing. I, I'm just so grateful and and it's only been. I mean, I think me and Tracy both say it's only been fantastic for us. The the having this experience, having instilled this experience. We just went to Lexington, Kentucky for a convention, and they were they were it blew us away. The the, the, the love, yeah. yeah. We're honestly going to be covering it all. Uh, so it's it's the series is really the life and times of of these two characters through many different experiences. Elias, Elias, let me ask about Elias. Deep cuts. Our show passes the Bechdel test. I'll just say that. <laughs> I just, I actually noticed tonight this movie actually passes the Bechdel test. You guys talk about your bed and and uh, and, and like stuff like that. It's a very progressive movie. <laughs> shout out to the shout out to the Progressive Friday Three. Uh, um, anybody? Any other questions? I get wave. It's like okay. Yeah. Thank you. Ask about keeping props in the movie. Yeah, <laughs> I got the, the fake axe that, that Shelly comes out. I, I have that, it's in my office. Uh, yeah, so I got that. I asked for the mask. I asked them for the mask, and they were like, no. And then no one knows where it went. They're like, no one knows where that original mask was. So and that uh, the blue bikini was my bikini, and it stayed with me for a while after. Until I stole it. Uh, one more, just wave it around. I think I see one in the middle. Yeah, yeah. What's your favorite class song? Uh, um, uh, Clampdown. Yay! Uh, that's a good one. Do you have another one? Way, way in the back. You, yep. Practical effects in the show. I, it'll probably be a combo, just depending on a lot of issues, but we want to lean into practical as much as possible and honor the the pedigree of the franchise. Prince of Ooh, the amazing yeah. 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 All right, so uh, just one last thing before we wrap things up. Now, I know, I personally, I hate being interrupted when I'm reading. Tracy, I wanted to give you this so you can finally finish it. Is there actually a Fangoria that you grabbed that you wanted to read? You can finally finish it without blood all over it. So enjoy that. Ladies and gentlemen, big round of applause for Larry, Tracy, and Brian. Um, if you guys have stuff for them to sign, uh, we do ask that we, we take that out of the lobby if you sort of kind of crowd them out here because that's, that's no.